pick what implications there are for this current crisis on global metal production, global metal prices, and basically the, the kind of the, the mining industry on the mining industry sector. Um, I'm going to give a, a you know, traditional mining talk. I'm going to give a disclaimer before we begin. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not an econo I can't even say, economist. And uh, this might have more history than you're going to be used to in a normal economic geology talk. So please bear with me. And we're going to be talking, as Tom said, about things like the Black Death and uh, the, the, the Spanish flu. Uh, but uh, what we want to do is we actually want to kind of flip it around, flip Charles Lyell's uh, uh, phrase that, you know, the, the present is key to the past. This time we're going to actually flip it around and look at the past as the key to what's happening in the present. Other disclaimers that things are changing rapidly. Uh, we're all seeing the news. We don't exactly know where we're going to be headed. There are some positives if we look at China, South Korea, where production, uh, you know, the manufacturing is increasing, after, certainly after the lockdowns in China. Uh, one question is, you know, how, because we live in a globalized society, how is metal production going to meet that increased demand and, and what we're going to, what, what's the picture going to look like? I don't have any crystal ball. I don't have any answers, but what I can do is provide some information that should pe get people thinking, I hope. There's some clear negatives. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on those. and well, I'm going to certainly mention them, but not uh, dwell on them in a huge amount of detail. All you've got to do for, to understand those is, is look at the news. But what there is at the minute is the length of time this is going to go on for is hugely uncertain. And I think... Uh, what certainly uh, companies, what businesses, uh, what investors don't like is uncertainty, and that's, that's affecting uh, everything right now. Uh, do consider this presentation speculative. I'm happy to discuss online immediately after. You can catch me on Twitter. You can email me uh, as things progress. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I, there's many, many experts out there, which I might be kind of half of one or a whole expert, if you like. Uh, but certainly, I'm happy to give my opinion or, or discuss any of the aspects in here if, if people wish. But the main thing outside of all of this uh, is keep safe and healthy. That's got to be the focus at this point. Uh, we can get through this. Everybody's saying we can get through this together, but that really is the truth right now. Um, so what we know is that um, we know that, uh, you know, metal production has grown throughout the 20th century, independent of major events of all types. We've had a huge number of different uh, uh, catastrophes or, or different global events in a number of ways. And these events have either caused hiatuses or a change in focus of metal production. And we can even go, and I'll mention this in a few slides time, back to the Black Death in the 1300s and even before that. Uh, COVID-19 represents, I think, a different challenge. You know, we're, we're going through quarantines and lockdowns. Uh, the impact of um, production is likely to be sharp. We see that kind of regionally and locally, and I'll, I'll discuss that a bit later. But hopefully, hopefully, it's short term relative to what we consider to be a typical mine life. You know, typical mine life might be 15, 50, 100 years in some cases. Uh, what we're seeing here is that short and transient uh, challenges or, or impacts on, the, on mining operations. The impact on demand is obviously a different matter. If we handle it properly, it's going to be transient, it's going to be short. But as we've all observed, handling it properly and actually understanding how to handle it properly is a, a key question that we're all trying to think about. And what we're seeing now is China is slowly unlocking. It's kind of slowly getting back to sort of normal. Uh, we're seeing demand increase as a result of their lockdown being lifted. But what's happening elsewhere is other parts of the world are going into lockdown. Producers elsewhere are shutting down. One of the key questions is that, that I can't answer right now is will demand be at pre-lockdown levels? And this is all something we're going to uh, basically look at over the next few months, uh, if you like. And there's also interplays between metals, the reliance on main products and byproducts. I'm not going to dwell on this, but this is always something to bear in the back of your mind. Uh, if you want a certain metal, that metal may well be a byproduct of another metal. So how is actually supply and demand going to affect the production of that? And what we're certainly seeing is a lot of volatility right now. Metal prices are volatile, including in traditional self safe havens like gold. Uh, usually, if there's a global crisis, you, people observe that gold prices and gold demand increases. But there's a certain uh, kind of bit of interplay going on with, between gold demand and gold prices and, and what's going on in the world. And I'll discuss that briefly towards the end. Uh, key points to think about. Uh, I can't answer all of these, but these are what we should be thinking about uh, right now. It's certainly what can we learn from the past? And I'll, I'll address a couple of areas of the of past where we can actually learn things. You know, what's going to impact metal supply and demand during COVID-19 and afterwards, after the kind of the, the peak that everybody's been talking about? How will the changes in both line up? Because metal supply and metal demand 
uh, these are uh, certainly will vary region by region because not everybody is undergoing the same kind of peak demand on, on hospitals and, and peak lockdowns at the same point. But the key here is longevity. The longer this lasts, the longer shutting down economies will last uh, is actually going to have a really big impact, obviously. And how long the pandemic will last in total, and what both look like, how they evolve over time. And as I've mentioned already, the countries to watch are China, South Korea, and Japan. These are sort of like uh, images of where the US, the UK, Europe might be in maybe a month's time or so, uh, because these are coming out of lockdown. South Korea and Japan have dealt with things slightly differently, slightly better, many would argue. Uh, will we see second peaks? Can they be managed? And how is demand for metals and, and even supply in, in certain of uh, these countries going to uh, bounce back? We know that demand is going to drop through lockdowns. We know demand will pick up afterwards, but what's the rate of this pickup? And what this kind of needs is a detailed analysis on a month-by-month -month basis, normalizing for other events and equally looking at past events to see how things have affected, how past pandemics, past economic crises have actually affected metal demand. Um, I haven't had time for this yet. Uh, this is going to be a very general overview, but certainly if anybody's interested in collaborating or thinking about this, has anybody got any funding? Because we all like funding. Uh, happy to discuss further or share some of this data. Just email me or tweet at me after the talk. It's not all doom and gloom. Uh, if we look at industry, the industries are being, some are being hit really hard. Some are actually expanding and they're going to require metals from upstream sources, metals and minerals and end products or in manufacturing these goods. These are just taken from the BBC website recently, just showing where demand has significantly increased. Bicycles, exercise gear, outdoor and indoor games, home and garden items, reading matter, electrical goods, fridges and freezers, coffee. Uh, certain of these obviously have more impact on the, the mining industry than others. Uh, and certainly medical equipment and more. But, you know, the question is, how is this going to change metal demand relative to metal production? What metals are in these items? How, how is this going to affect what happens in the future? And I don't have an answer for this as yet, but this is something that we can certainly think about in terms of understanding the impact of COVID-19. And this is, uh, as many people have called it, this is an unprecedented scenario. But there are things we can learn from the past. Humanity has gone through previous crises, each of which have impacted metal production in different ways. And we can look at, and I'll go into a bit more detail later on in this talk, but three different scenarios. We have major global and regional conflicts like World War I, World War II, the Korean War. Uh, we have pandemics. There's limited data on these. Uh, for example, the 1918 to 19 influenza, the Spanish flu, as it's called. Uh, but this was obviously heavily associated with World War I. So you've got this kind of this feedback and interaction of events. And we have financial crises like the Great Depression and the global financial crisis. And each has influenced metal production in different ways or seemingly has not influenced it at all. And the approaches to resolving these crises are varied. And it's important to think about how our approach to COVID-19 may affect primary industries and also the industries that require the metals we produce. And as I say, this is kind of flipping Charles Lyell, a famous geologist, quote around, instead of the present being key to the past. In this case, potentially the past might be the key to the present. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start off by going quite a bit, uh, not geologically a significant amount of distance in the past, but certainly uh, in human history, uh, going back to the Black Death, the uh, um, Yersinia pestis, uh, I've got a couple of these giant plushy microbes just to add a bit of amusement. I've in fact got more pictures of these in here than I have of rocks, so it's not the a typical geology talk. Uh, but to give you a bit of background on the Black Death, uh, it killed between 75 and 200 million people in Eurasia and about 1.4 million people in England. And there was a good uh, 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 bit of research done by Gelman in 1982 uh, who actually looked at the impact of this pandemic uh, on, um, on, on the economy of England. Uh, what we saw is, you know, obviously this is a long time ago, but we did see a significant change in all sectors, basically rural, urban, and international trade. But one thing we saw in the 100 years between the epidemic or the pandemic and the, the English economy 100 years later is that the economy actually improved. 100 years is a long time, yes, uh, especially considering, uh, you know, the, the rate of life these days. Uh, but also this is a significant cost. Population in the 1450s was still 50 to 70% of pre-Black Death peak. We saw a change in uh, rural poverty, less prevalent. Rents fell, workers earned higher wages in all sectors in real and nominal terms. The largest increase to artisans, the people who actually made things. 
and inflation also helped reduce the debt of peasants to landowners. And the demand for, we actually can see, and, and, and Gelman looked at the demand for different uh, products, certainly demand for grain fell, but as, as a smaller wealth of population after the pandemic, they consume more meat, cheese, and hops. And I think quite a lot of us are seeing a, an increase in hop consumption these days with the amount of alcohol people seem to be buying. We saw increased demand for manufactured goods afterwards, increased imports of silk and other luxury items. And all of this kind of points to a relatively wealthy England with a more equal distribution of income 100 years after the world's worst pandemic. Uh, we saw an increase in mobility, workforce and population. Uh, we saw cities becoming less crowded, uh, but the proportion of population in urban areas increased. Some settlements did become deserted. So this is kind of the, what you typically imagine in terms of the kind of black death scenario. But then we saw some industries become international. We saw, in, in essence, kind of 1450-style globalization. Uh, but the one thing to note is that, it's similar to COVID-19, an economic depression was not universal in affected areas or affected sectors of the economy. And it's not a direct consequence, in this case, of a loss of population. It's basically the same as we're seeing now. We're seeing changes in demand initially during the pandemic, and we will see probably changes in demand for materials afterwards as we progress through this and indeed afterwards. <laughs> what we've seen is a time of redistribution of income where England improved its position in Europe and underwent a significant increase in economic health despite the really negative impacts of this pandemic. But we're economic geologists, we're interested in metals. So one question is what about metals? How, what can we actually tell about the metal production sector at this time? If we look at evidence from Germany and Cornwall, kind of written historical records, they suggest that the mines in these, uh, these heavily mined areas at the time shut down. Those are the Hartz mines in Germany, apparently which may have shut for 100 years plus. But if we actually look at evidence for ice cores, and this is a, a paper by uh, Moore et al. In a, few year, a couple of years ago, looking at lead concentrations in ice cores as a proxy for industrial activity, mining and smelting. What we've got here is we've actually got the Black Death pandemic compared to kind of normal activity before and afterwards. What we essential, what this is interpreted to show is essentially a complete shutdown of the metal mining industry at this time, or, or near complete shutdown. Maybe a slight increase in the middle, but certainly way lower than the lead levels in the atmosphere around it. Sorry about that. But one thing we can see is that, okay, this is not all doom and gloom. We have the period of the Black Death, but one thing we look at is actually lead in the atmosphere as a proxy for smelting activity increasing. We have another slight decrease here, maybe again related to economic change or another epidemic, uh, but we have this increase to levels even before the Black Death. So we have to have a kind of resurgence in um, the, the metal or the, the mining sector as a, as a result of picking up after the Black Death. So the picture again is not all doom and gloom. The changes we see, these long term, or these, these, these changes over tens or, or decades in this case, these changes we would expect to be far quicker uh, if, we, if the same things happen uh, now with COVID 19. So the picture is not all doom and gloom. We can see that there's profound change, lots of uncertainty. Uh, the pandemic, the, the, knowledge of, uh, the knowledge of medicine was obviously far less during the Black Death, uh, which obviously bodes well for us now. But what we may see is something like this, a, a slowdown. But then as things pick up afterwards, we actually see resurgence to at least levels before uh, or maybe even more than that, depending on what, how we see this, things, this thing progress. The next uh, pandemic I want to uh, address is the, the 1918 to 19 Spanish H1N1 influenza pandemic. Uh, what we, we know that in this case, we've got better records. Uh, we know that it infected up to 500 million people between 1918 and 1920. Uh, the 17 million to 100 million deaths in total, uh, estimates range between uh, the Spanish flu, if you're not sure, the named after was the first news release of infections in Spain. Uh, potentially originated in Kansas in the US, but World War I censorship prevented negative news getting out. And there's a good report by the uh, St. Louis Fed Reserve, uh, Garrett in 2007, who actually examines the 1918 influenza pandemic and suggests what might happen in any future pandemic. So in other words, what, uh, what might happen, for example, during COVID-19. It's certainly worth a read, and I can hand on links to this if people are interested. Uh, what we're seeing is, again, with, if we look at the Spanish flu, we have a positive correlation between population density and mortality. Cities are being harder hit than rural areas. Uh, but one question is, what's the economic impact of this? And how does this influence the, the metal mining sector? 
and with this, because we're, the, the timing of the, this, this influenza pandemic, 1918, at the end of World War II, it's actually fairly too hard to discern what the influence of the, the waning days of World War II and, and what happened after that and the, the actual influence that the pandemic was. And this is just a, 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 a basically diagram showing stock prices. So this is dollars per share for the Dow Jones. Uh, we have an industrial stock average from about January 1915 to July 1921. And what we have here is we have a, a bit of variation during World War II. Uh, the pandemic actually started here in January 1918, uh, went through to about January, well, uh, end, of end of 1919, more or less. What we actually saw is a, a drop in 1917 to 1918 probably relate to World War I. Then we have a pickup afterwards. Uh, we have a, this, this gray area, and the gray areas on all of the charts I'll show are actual uh, depressions. And we have a pickup in share prices up to here. But one of the questions we need to think about is, you know, what's influencing these share prices? Uh, certainly, uh, we still have the effect of World War I censorship at this time. Unlike here, we don't have a huge amount of news being passed around globally. Uh, so what people would be focusing on is that global conflict rather than the actual effect of the pandemic. So maybe the one case here is that not knowing actually didn't, uh, didn't meant that the, the negative influence on shares we saw recently uh, wasn't the same here. The other thing to note in the, um, just focusing on the more economic side of economic geology, uh, we've all heard about central banks uh, changing interest rates to try and mitigate the, the impact of COVID-19. Uh, the Federal Reserve was founded, I believe, in around 1910 or maybe 1913, uh, but the fledging Federal Reserve in the US didn't actually react to the pandemic at all. Uh, it increased interest rates, uh, and then obviously it, increased, it actually increased rate, interest rates during the, the Great Depression here, uh, but we don't actually see any move by central banks to mitigate the impacts of this pandemic. Very opposite scenario to what we're seeing today. And this is the industrial average, this is 1918 to 1923. Here's the, 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 essentially the, the span of the uh, Spanish flu. We have a, a recession probably related to the end of World War, um, World War I. We have picking up a, a slight boom afterwards in the global financial crisis. But what we're seeing here is there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of impact of this pandemic in terms of what we're seeing of, if you use the Dow Jones industrial average as a proxy from the economy. We see a financial crisis having a more major effect. How that financial crisis might have been linked to the pandemic is out of the scope of this talk, and I'm not going to uh, even try and attempt to discuss that. But certainly, if you just take this as a proxy, uh, we see actually things, things pick up during the, 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 the time of the pandemic. That might be related to the end of the world war, it might not have anything to do with the pandemic, but this is where it's important to distinguish between correlations and causation. You can have a nice correlation, but that correlation may not actually be causative in any way. That's something to think about as we go through a, a lot of the graphs I'm going to show today. And this just kind of shows the, the, the longer scale impact from 1916 through to 1940. Again, we have these periods of depressions. This is the Great Depression. But if you actually look at it, here we have a 1918, the end of the uh, World War, uh, the onset of the pandemic. This is the period of the pandemic through here. There's a po slight positive change, nothing like the positive change we saw leading up to the Great Depression. Uh, but what we actually see is very little in the way of uh, the Spanish flu having any impact on the Dow Jones industrial stock prices. Um, why, why this is the case, why we're seeing changes now, uh, we can, do, as I say, we can happily, I'll happily discuss this with anybody who has ideas afterwards, uh, after I've finished the talk. What we know about the Spanish flu is that it's, it's very similar to what we're seeing now. Um, you know, they're, they're influenced by knocking out of healthcare facilities, uh, inability to dispose of the deceased in cities like Philadelphia, which were very hard hit. We saw medical staff and facilities overwhelmed by the virus, which increased the duration and severity of the pandemic. We know that local quarantines hurt businesses in the short run. We know that even uninfected experienced financial hardships. But the quarantine, people have noted in the Spanish flu, was only effective if it was total. If you're partial, like in, as was the case in Washington, D.C. and St. Louis in the U.S., it did actually did little to stop the spread. So anything sounding familiar in terms of what we're hearing on the news today, uh, basically uh, the, the, the situation is, is fairly similar. Some businesses underwent more than 50% revenue losses. Others increased in business, healthcare services and products, and that's exactly what we're seeing today. 
some employees saw temporary increases in wages. We're seeing that today as well. Um, but overall, the influenza, this two-year influenza uh, uh, was short-lived, but it permanently influenced individuals in society. And if individuals affected by it were permanently influenced, the collective of society overall had very little influence, had very little impact, uh, according to what I've read about the Spanish flu, at least. So society recovered quickly. Individuals are affected, had lives changed forever. And this may be the same for COVID-19. And what we don't necessarily see, I mean, obviously, this, this may have this certainly caused changes in society and society's opinion. And what we, we might see the same with COVID-19, we might not. I, I, it's difficult to speculate about, about this at this time. But this is an economic geology talk. Uh, I've given you enough uh, economics for now. What we're going to look at is actually metals and how metals have been influenced by these global events. Uh, what we've got is it's important to think about the differences before we get into that. Is uh, you know what's the difference between say a hundred years ago and today? Obviously, we're more globalized. You know, we have markets and economies which are intrinsically linked. Uh, we have social media. We have a twenty-four hour news cycle. Uh, we compared to nineteen eighteen, where the things were heavily censored. We know what is going on, at least or we think we do. Medicine has significantly improved, you know, mortality rates are significantly lower than this had happened 100 or 50 years ago. And just that this is a link to the BBC who uh, actually had a story about, if you think about what, how, how COVID-19 had happened 15 years ago, what would it have been like? Uh, we, you know, we certainly would have had more necessary movement and gatherings. And if the UK at least had only 8 million households with broadband. The rest are on that kind of dial up the modem noise we're all used to be familiar with. Uh, so actually, you know, ordering things online or even staying connected would have been far harder if this had happened 15 years ago. I'm not saying it's good that it's happening now, right? That's not, the, not what I'm saying here. But what I'm saying is here we have technologies and abilities to mitigate uh, the impact of this, uh, this, this, this pandemic. Although equally, globalization, the fact that we have markets and economies intrinsically linked, it may be a negative point, and we can discuss this later. So what we can do is we can actually get into the metal supply and demand and look at metal prices and production. Uh, we look at, uh, if we look at metal prices and production between 1900 and 2015, we can actually look at the three types of major events. I will look at COVID-19 and uh, more recent changes at the end of the talk. Uh, we have pandemics. We have major conflicts and we have financial crises and there's also a series of depressions that are marked in gray in the, the figures I'm going to show shortly. You know, one key question before we get into this is, are these major events the drivers in terms of changes in metal pricing and production or are they smaller variations that actually impact larger cycles? And one of the other questions that to think about is that, you know, can major events like the global financial crisis start or stop the underlying cycles. If you're familiar with the mining industry, we talk, to, we talk about booms and busts. You know, can these events actually kickstart a boom or a bust? Uh, and you know, what are all the feedbacks involved? We always talk about feedbacks when we're dealing with climate change and kind of climate analysis. We need to think about that in terms of metal production and metal pricing. What are the multiple feedbacks going on that actually is controlling variations in this? This is one example of these underlying cycles. This is just a, a paper I put up in an OzIMM bulletin uh, five years ago, looking at basically booms and busts, look, uh, using BHP share prices as a proxy, how they, wrote, how they ascended and then fell. We've got kind of a, a basically, um, we have Korean industrialization and a gold bubble collapse. We have ex then we have another boom, then a bust, then we have a slight boom, then we have the major boom during Chinese industrialization up to 2008 all of a sudden stopped by the global financial crisis. And then we go through to kind of the present day with economic stimulus and the European debt crisis. What we can see is that, you know, mining shares, uh, both BHP and also the mining shares in Australia, uh, peaked and slumped, peaked and slumped, just as a result of these major cycles. And these major cycles are things we need to bear in mind when we're looking at metal production and metal prices, because these are in some ways the dominant controls and it needs to be a major event to actually cause the, the ending of one of these cycles and whether we're going through one of these now uh, is up to uh, is certainly a question that we need to consider. If we look at the Dow Jones just again as a proxy for global economy, this is not adjusted for inflation going from 1900 to 2015. What I've marked on here is basically that this is the variations in share price in dollars, the Dow Jones industrial average. Uh, we have various events. We have uh, major conflicts marked in italics, so World War I, uh, 
World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, uh, the First and Second Congo Wars here as well. Uh, these are kind of long duration, pretty large conflicts. And we have, a, a, we have a, our pandemics, the influenza, uh, H2N2, the Hong Kong flu. Uh, we have SARS, the swine flu. Uh, we have uh, Ebola and Zika and also HIV and AIDS, which is a long duration epi uh, pandemic. And we have our financial crises like the Great Depression, uh, the OPEC oil shock, Black Monday, the 1979 energy crisis, and the global financial crisis. What we can see is a general upwards trend, as you'd expect. Uh, this is, you know, we have a large slumps related to the, the major financial crises, the Great Depression, the global financial crisis. Uh, and we have these, the, the epidemics here. And the, you know, the, the actual, uh, if we look at the, um, the Spanish flu, the, the influenza pandemic back here at the end of World War I, what we see is actually coincides with a peak and then there's a slight dip, but the duration of this is actually kind of partly uh, of where this peak is actually rising here. So one would argue that in terms of share prices as a proxy for the economy, the Spanish flu didn't have any major impact. And again, the thing to bear in mind is correlation doesn't equal causation. It's, it's important to think about, well, okay, you know, did Zika really cause this dip or was Zika just here and we actually kind of dealt with it and uh, it didn't really affect the global economy. Uh, if we actually look at previous ec epidemics and pandemics, these are the share price changes through each of these epidemics. Obviously, the HIV AIDS uh, the, for the starting in 1981, continuing to the present day. Uh, these are uh, some of these longer lasting than single months or single or six or 12 months. Uh, but, you know, if we look at things like uh, SARS, uh, the, we saw uh, the S&P, again, another proxy for global uh, economies, basically increasing by 14 or 20 percent. So what we're seeing is that these, these uh, somewhat smaller or lower impact epidemics and pandemics actually not really having a huge effect on global economies. It's not the case here, at least in the short term, but what we'll do is we'll look at short and longer term, uh, as I say, later on in this talk. If we look at metals, this is what we're all here for. Uh, I've got a series of four diagrams looking at copper, nickel, zinc, and, and gold. Uh, basically, each of these diagrams on the left, we're going to have copper, we're going to have uh, metal price uh, uh, normalized for inflation. So they're all 1998 equivalents. And we have copper, uh, in this case, production. So copper production, in this case, a million tons of copper. What we've got here is we've just got a, a series of peaks and troughs uh, through with copper price over time, a big peak in World War I, then a slump afterwards, obviously, as, as economies changed from a war footing to a more kind of normal footing and, and the demand for these metals decreased. Uh, we have the Great Depression, which is significant decrease as a result of uh, just the, the slowing down of the economy. Uh, World War II, the copper price didn't vary, very went up and down, certainly went down towards the end of the conflict as people probably realized that you know, we, we might be producing more copper than we can use. And we can see that in the copper production here, the copper production drop off. Uh, we have, uh, there's, but there's, there, doesn't, there seems to be correlations with major economic events, uh, cert or certainly like the Great Depression, the financial crisis but there doesn't seem to be an effect of these major pandemics and the, the smaller epidemics on the, certainly the price of copper or even copper production. We see more effects of uh, things like, uh, if we look at, as again, if we look at conflicts uh, like World War II, the end of World War II had a significant impact. The Great Depression had an impact. Global financial crisis had an impact. We saw copper production flatten, but copper prices drop. Uh, obviously negatively impacting the copper sector. But what we're seeing is in terms of these, these, these annual data, not a huge amount of influence in terms of the, uh, um, the kind of global, you know, the, the, the global mining sector and not of these pandemics or epidemics. The same with nickel. Uh, nickel, we actually saw a, a slump in nickel price during uh, the World War I, a slump in nickel price during World War II. The Great Depression, we had a price rise in nickel, but not by a huge amount. Uh, we have a, um, uh, this is actually in, in thousands rather than just $30 a, a ton of nickel. Uh, we have the global financial crisis where we have a significant drop. But again, if you look at the pandemics, the pandemics like the Spanish flu, the epidemics like the Hong Kong flu, they just kind of, they don't have a huge impression on the nickel price. They don't have a huge impression on things like uh, uh, nickel production. If we look at a year by year basis, 
And if we think about this, this might just reflect the fact, again, we're dealing with mines with a long lifespan. You know, the, the average lifespan or, or typical lifespans might range from 10 to 100 years. These events are on the order of one or two years maximum. Uh, certainly the major impact of these events are far shorter. So what we're seeing is we're seeing these events not having any significant long-term impact on, on nickel or, 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 or copper or even zinc. I mean, this is zinc. We see a huge spike in zinc price during World War One, and we see a significant uh, uh, increase during World War Two, and we see a drop during the global financial crisis and the Great Depression. We don't see necessarily uh, the same things occurring uh, with these pandemics or epidemics. We see a little drop in zinc price, uh, maybe associated with the uh, that, that correlates with the, uh, the Spanish flu with uh, zinc production. But again, this is probably just leading into, um, uh, or leading into the uh, function of the end of World War I, leading into the depression here, rather than actually any meaningful impact of the, the, the pandemic. Whether the pandemic led into that depression or not is of course another matter, but there's a significant distance between, in terms of time, between this pandemic and the, uh, the actual depression marked in gray here. Uh, we see influences of uh, the global financial crisis, and we see a slump in zinc prices to the present day. That's not caused by Zika. It's caused by changes in, in zinc demand and so on. Uh, but overall, if we look at epidemics and pandemics, we don't see a huge uh, change in, in base metal prices or production. Gold is obviously a little different. Uh, gold uh, price and production, gold is considered a safe haven. Uh, so what we actually see is things like the 1979 energy crisis, we see a big spike in gold price. Uh, the global financial crisis up through here, we see a spike in gold price. We don't see any spike associated with the, uh, the, the Spanish flu. We see one associated with the Great Depression. Again, these big economic crises uh, have an impact on gold price. Uh, and, but they don't seem to be affect. Gold price doesn't seem to be affected hugely by pandemics or epidemics. And there's a couple of slides at the end that I'm going to talk about uh, gold prices and how that might, how, what's happening currently in gold prices. If we look at metal production in gold, we have a, a, a bit of a slump during World War One. It's not an essential my, uh, metal to be produced. Same with World War Two. There's far more essential metals to be produced. Uh, we see a, a, an increase after the global financial crisis a decrease towards it, then an increase, probably as a function of the, the decrease in prices, then this increase. Uh, but again, we don't see a huge impact. And we wouldn't expect to see an impact necessarily on metal production. Uh, the prices are probably the, the things that might be affected by pandemics and epidemics, but as I'll show, these may only be short-term variations. So what we've got is a, a, a scenario where long-term friends are fairly consistent and underlying cycles are key. But we need to know what's influencing what. And picking that apart is pretty complex at times. Uh, financial crises seem to have the largest impacts. Remember that COVID-19 is causing one of these, but there are differences. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no kind of underlying issues in the, the global financial sector, like the subprime mortgages that cause the global financial crisis. Pandemics and epidemics may have some, some impact. These tend to have fairly short-term peaks. Uh, hopefully that will be the case of COVID-19. And these are often overprinted by other major events or, or changes that are also going on, maybe more dominant in terms of metal supply and demand. And these data don't show short-term price volatility. And that's what we're seeing a lot of right now. I'll show us to grasp later on that actually documents this. But one thing to remember is that the mining industry and the industry we supply do not operate on short-term basis. You know, they're given the significant amount of time you need to develop a mine or a smelter or a manufacturing facility. This is obviously five, 10 years, maybe decades compared to a pandemic, which hopefully would only last for a year or so given uh, modern medicine. You know, if we, if we look at even modern medicine in 1918, the Spanish flu only lasted a, a maximum of a year. And the, the major impact of that was far shorter. We know that short-term spikes and dips are to be expected. But all of these graphs on an annual basis indicate that by major changes, such as the global financial crisis, metal demand and pricing remains relatively stable over time. Some metals go up in price, other metals go down, reflecting their use and their cons whether they're considered safe havens or not. And this suggests that the impact of pandemics, like the 1918-19 influenza, like COVID-19, will have a limited impact on the mining industry. The underlying trends are more important overall. Obviously, things seem to be grinding to a halt, but these underlying trends are still there, and they still will be there once we actually get past the peak and can actually mitigate this, the current crisis. So this, so, 
I like that uh, just the kind of title there. So what uh, this impact may be lim limited temporarily, may not affect overall sector in a significant way in terms of metal production capacity and output. The impact will undoubtedly be significant on mining company employees, the people we have, the skill base we have, uh, as well as smaller, maybe even mid-tier or major mining companies. Uh, hopefully, you know, one thing to do is to hold on to your people because we don't want a brain drain of people because we will come out of this. It's similar to the Black Death and the uh, Spanish flu. Community impact is small and short term. Individual impacts may be huge. And this is where if we, as a community, we need to kind of come together and uh, uh, work together to help mitigate these impacts on an individual basis. And I'm not trying to belittle this impact on what we're going through. The idea is to focus on larger scale changes and how they're influenced by major events, seemingly little by pandemics that we've seen to date. And hopefully we can make sure that this continues to be the case for COVID-19. But what we're seeing now is a whole load of shorter term changes, volatility. You know, what happens in other pandemics and epidemics? I've got a few slides here and then I'll go into the COVID-19 and what's happening right now. Uh, if this is a, a couple of examples of, again, influences on and looking at it in a bit more detail in terms of the time frame. Uh, this is the Dow Jones Industrial Average for the 1968 to 69 flu pandemic. We have the pandemic beginning here, becoming widespread in the US. We have the peak and then we basically have the end of the pandemic here. What we've got is we've got a slight dip, but this dip may not be related to the virus. We have a peak as we see it emerge in the US, but again, may not be related. There's all sorts of underlying other things going on here that need, we need to unpick. So basically what we're talking about here is, you know, is, is, are these related to this flu uh, pandemic? Probably not, but you know, what effect did this flu pandemic have on, the, on, the, on stocks, on metal pricing and metal supply? And the same with 2009, uh, the, the swine flu, H1N1. Uh, we have the virus beginning here. We have the, the pandemic. Uh, we have a, a clinical trials of a vaccine. We have virus peaking in the US, sorry. And then we have the virus ending. But all of this is probably influenced by, you know, coming out of the global financial crisis and other developments rather than anything to do with this pandemic. And again, this is the coronavirus. So this is what's happening in the present day. We have our kind of background, various economic changes. We have our virus uh, begins, the first reports, public health emergency. Then we have the sudden realization by the markets that, oh, crap, this is actually hitting us all. And we're going to have to actually use quarantine methods to deal with it. And lo and behold, this is where we get this large slump, which continued, but then things have picked up shortly afterwards. And the, the, one of the things you could say is this is the market reacting to uncertainty. Markets hate uncertainty, and that's why people panic and start to sell off shares and stocks and, and the like. In terms of what's going on right now, these are a few headlines I've picked out. So this is a, a Quebec miners being told to shut down as a result of COVID-19 on the 25th of March. Uh, non-essential businesses and services for three weeks. Whether mining is essential or not depends on, on the region, the legislature in a given region. Uh, so this, this kind of affects some areas more than others. Um, certainly, uh, we can, this is one example here in Nevada, uh, Pumpkin Hollow can stay open during coronavirus, although this may have subsequently changed. Basically, it didn't classify it as essential or non-essential, but they're classified as unique in a remote area. They could, there's no public interaction. They can continue to operate. So each legislation, each, each government, regional or, or national, is going to have its own approach to how to deal with COVID-19. And that's going to affect different mining companies, different mining operations, different. And that's one of the things we need to think about is what's actually going to happen over the next few weeks or months, potentially. South Africa shut down mining for all mining in South Africa for three weeks as a result of a lockdown, employing more than nearly half a million people. Uh, basically, this is a, a just a, a um, this is a kind of a, a very uh, cracking down a pro way of uh, dealing with COVID nineteen. But also, you know, this is probably the right. I would say maybe the right thing to do. I'm not the you know the, the part of the government of South Africa, but certainly from the outside looking inwards, it would seem to be the right thing to do to you know help for, for health and safety reasons. Um, and, but equally, you know, if you shut uh, mines in the bush vault and the like, you start to push palladium prices up. And this is what's influencing metal prices, because if we have these localized shutdowns, especially in important areas like the bush vault, you're going to drive prices up elsewhere, which is going to be benefit the miners that can stay open, or at least the miners that stay open for a period before they have to shut down as a result of lockdowns. 
So there's all sorts of interplays between different regions and what's happening in different regions. And understanding this is actually going to help us to understand, you know, the, 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 the short and medium term impact of COVID-19 on the, the metal mining sector. We also have a, um, a volatility. So these are two different stories. This is from the, yesterday, this is from today. Uh, this is from Kitco News, basically Bloomberg Intelligence, saying gold prices uh, uh, within, uh, you know, basically uh, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna see gold prices uh, increasing as a result of the, this, this pandemic. Uh, on the right hand side, we're actually saying, oh, well, no, gold prices won't increase. Uh, because in this case, the Russia's central bank has stopped buying gold because of low oil prices. And as a result, what you're seeing is basically two different headlines in two different days uh, next to each other. And we know, basically this just indicates the volatility of what's going on in the world. People making, having to make rapid decisions, and those rapid decisions are having rapid effects and rapid turnarounds in terms of what we're actually seeing might happen in the future, in the short term, the medium term, never mind the long term. And what we are, there's also the kind of background overprinting trends we're seeing, like copper production is still going to grow in 2020. Increased volumes from Cobre Panama and Grassberg means that it's going to go up by about 1.9% this year, independent of any effect of the pandemic. Uh, but nickel, basically, what we're going to see is we're going to see nickel production probably maintaining and maybe shutting down in certain areas. But what we might have is 10% is of global supply in, in, in surplus metals. That might cause a contraction in the, the, the nickel uh, price or in terms of the, the nickel sector. Whether that happens or not, you know, this, these are all predictions. Uh, people are obviously concerned over nickel fundamentals, over the, the, the nature of nickel mining at the minute. Uh, what we could see is we might see metal prices rally, then metal prices, you know, as, when we actually know what will happen or the duration of this thing. So in terms of what's going on right now, mines are deemed non-essential businesses by some, but not all legislations. We're seeing shutting down as a result of personnel testing, positive and lockdowns rolling out globally. Some areas, China, South Korea, both of which have large demands of metals are reopening, increasing demand in these cases, but there's not huge amounts of internal supply for key metals uh, from these countries. The smelters in China and South Korea are obviously demand concentrates uh, of copper and other metals from elsewhere. Um, so what we might well see is these, these smelters actually demand more metal as they start to kind of increase production and also start to feed the, the economies in China and South Korea as they pick up. We're undergoing global financial stimulus. It's great. It's going to bridge gaps, may not increase production, and we may need more stimulus to actually restart the economy. If you actually get you know, people consuming metals starting up again, then that's actually going to kind of kickstart the rest of the economy. We're going to see that filter down towards the, the mining industry and the primary producers. You know, some people might, might argue that a, a Keynesian type approach to economics where we just keep on giving stimulus until we get back to a seemingly normal levels is needed. I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to kind of dwell on that too much. But equally, one thing is always the case, you know, mines are complex operations. What's the time taken to go from care and maintenance to return to full production compared to a mine life? This is short, uh, certainly, but uh, well, there's obviously some time lag going from the ending of a lockdown or the gradual cessation of a lockdown and, and back to full production. And one question is, you know, how we've looked at the long-term trends, but how is all of this affecting share metal prices in the short term? This is a share prices. So this is, uh, again, this is another proxy for global, for the, the US economy or global economy over a six month period from October uh, last year to more or less the present day. Uh, here we have the realization that this, the COVID-19 is gonna hit and hit hard. So we get the dip. And then we actually get a, a peak up here as, as a little bit more certainty comes back into the market as we kind of know more about what is going on. Uh, this is uh, from a couple of days ago, uh, but this is the, the, basically we have the, the declaration of a pandemic on the 11th of March. 10 days later, we saw a slump as we realized the impact of that pandemic on, on areas like Europe and the US. If we look at metal price reactions, uh, this is again, these are all on six months, uh, over six month trends. We have a gentle increase in copper price. Uh, we have a, a slump that has nothing to do, or potentially not much to do with COVID-19. This might be shutting down in China. Uh, the impact of Chinese uh, uh, production decreases as a result of lockdowns in places like Wuhan. Go back to kind of normal, basically the same as we saw in uh, uh, September, October, 2019. And the slump, correlating to the slump of the global economy as we went back, as we kind of dropped to, uh, uh, as, as things started to lock down. 
We can see the same with the zinc, a slightly different trend. Again, uh, we get a slightly different trend going down here. It's far more uh, gradual decrease in the zinc price. This might be just an underlying trend with some volatility associated with COVID-19 down here. This might be related to the Chinese lockdowns in, uh, lockdowns in China. Nickel, we might have again the influence of lockdowns in China than the, the actual COVID-19 globally. Uh, uh, but if we look at gold, Gold has been up and down quite, uh, quite uh, violently, if you like. Uh, we have a, an increase here, uh, which is at the end of the year, may or may not be related to China. And then we have increases and decreases as a result of the, the COVID-19 uncertainty. So you get a big drop off in gold and a big increase in gold. Then we probably have another, we have another slight drop off in gold, uh, basically as a, as, a, as a result of kind of volatility. Whether people are considering gold to be a, a, sol a safe haven or not at the minute is a, kind of open to discussion. If we look at other precious metals, this is palladium, and what we have here is a, an increase, then we have COVID-19 decrease, then what happens here is this is where South Africa says we're going to shut our mines. Uh, and obviously, the, this causes a spike in uh, palladium prices, also in platinum prices, so not to the same extent. Uh, but obviously, if we, if we see the same happening in Russia, if Russia decides to shut down Norilsk and the like, although the, the remote nature of Norilsk may, may mean that that doesn't happen, um, what we actually might see is a similar increase in prices in metals, which obviously would benefit uh, producers outside of the, the, the bush felt or the, the places that are actually locked down. And this is the kind of, kind of case of this, this rolling blackout where you get certain mines in certain areas shutting down, metal prices might pick up and benefit mines in other areas. And then when these mines come back on stream, we might see a correction of the price as that supply increases again. But then other areas might shut down and it's gonna be kind of a rolling picture as we go forward. Let's just platinum again. Uh, this is a, a bit, if we actually look at the, the, the this is copper prices for uh, uh, the global financial crisis. Uh, versus COVID-19. Here's the drop off of COVID-19 up to yesterday, uh, which is actually kind of, you know, if you actually look at this, you wouldn't, be, and I didn't tell you when COVID-19 was, you wouldn't necessarily be able to pick out this change in metal prices. How long this dip continues for is the, the open question. We're currently in this right now and we don't know, uh, but certainly this is the dip related to the global financial crisis. And we're talking about a, a significant a decrease compared a significantly larger decrease coming off a major boom compared to what we're seeing now. But uncertainty is the kind of enemy here. We certainly see volatility in the drop in expected demand for metals, but we don't know how that drop in demand for metals is going to roll out globally. And if we look at gold, uh, this is gold, global financial crisis increases the price uh, because people view gold as a self ha safe haven. Uh, but basically what we've seen here, we haven't seen any huge movements seen an increase here and an increase here, but this is kind of mid-2019, uh, mid end of 2019. And then we've got that volatility I showed in that previous graph. Uh, basically, what, we, what we're seeing is we're seeing a bit of increase in gold, but we don't know whether we're going to see a sustained increase in gold prices or not. It's unclear at this stage. Um, and I think that's maybe because we saw initial uncertainty, but then countries started dealing with lockdowns and actually enacting quarantines and that uncertainty has reassured the market and has basically meant that the gold price has not kept on increasing. And there's also other economic factors at play. This is the oil price. Uh, basically what we've got here is we've got oil price on January 1st down to uh, March 30th. We have big slumps associated with uh, uh, not only with the coronavirus reducing demand but also countries within OPEC like Saudi Arabia flooding the market with oil. Are actually producing more oil or releasing more oil into the market. It's depressing the oil price to levels we haven't seen for quite some time. And as a result, this obviously is going to benefit metal miners because oil and, and, and fuel is actually a major, uh, a, a major cost in their operations. So this may actually, this, this, this is not good for oil and gas producers, but may well be good for uh, the mining industry and their, and their large consumption of oil, gas and so on. And the key right now is just to go back to COVID-19. This is just cases globally. Uh, here we have the US uh, leading the way now. Here we have China. Uh, we have a, a, a South Korea and Japan. Uh, basically, the, the key right now is China and how what's going to happen in China as we go forward and what we, that means for the rest of us as we reach this peak and start to flatten out. You can see, thankfully, a lot of these trends are starting to flatten out. We hope that's going to continue to be the case. When that happens, manufacturing is going to ramp up again. Demand from other countries will be impacted in some sectors. 
You know, this is a global economic system we're dealing with. Exports from China will be hit by lockdowns and drop in demand for certain commodities or certain products in other countries. How long demand lulls last? Will they be equal by drops in supply? This kind of rolling blackout analogy I mentioned, uh, you know, where certain areas will shut down for a time but then come back on stream. How are we going to match supply and demand? And is that going to cause gluts in supply or, or, or increases in demand as a result of major mines being shut down and that causes short-term price spikes? And as the other countries recover, what is going to, the impact is going to be and how are their industries going to recover? And this, the balance of supply and demand is key here, but it's not easy to predict. I'm not going to even go into that in any huge amount of uh, detail uh, because I don't know the answer. If I did know the answer, I wouldn't be an economic geologist. I'd probably be a billionaire living on an island somewhere, uh, speculating in stocks and shares. Uh, you know, the, the key points to consider and key points to think about as I finish this talk, you know, is the global COVID-19 recession, how long will it last? Is it going to be a short, sharp shock? Is it going to be a long-lasting pain? And what's it going to take to come out of lockdown and restart safely? Are countries willing to do that? What's been taken out of the equation in this case? It's essentially people. There's no reason why things can't get back to normality or some sort of new normality potentially soon after we get through this. There's no weakened banks. There's no subprime mortgage crisis. The, what we're dealing with here is a, a pandemic that once we remove or, or mitigate that pandemic, things are going to be maybe not socially the same, but in terms of the economics may well be very similar. People are still going to want to buy things. People are still going to be purchasing things as long as we get the economies going again and money back in people's pockets. It's like a pause rather than a kind of decline, one would argue. How long that pause lasts is key. If we can shorten it, things can get back to normal. People can get back to earning money normally and things can actually get back to a, a, a normal economy. But it's, the, it's all about duration. And the, how, you know, the same, the, I'm not an epidemiologist, but the approach used seems to be key. Clamp down hard and ensure a short, painful shock. Get it over with and then deal with it. But, you know, the priority here has to be people's health and well-being. Test, test, test. As a, I'm not an epidemiologist, but South Korea, Japan are doing this. Uh, they're actually coming out of this fairly successfully, it seems, from the pictures we have. Look to these countries as examples and actually build that into current strategies. We're still learning about this virus. Things may well get worse before they get better, but the underlying message is they will get better. So to summarize, you know, COVID-19, like other pandemics, we've got a significant risk to the global mining industry. Uh, understanding the virus is key to understanding the risk. If we understand the risk, we understand the uncertainty. Investors like that as well, but we can certainly mitigate uh, that, that, that uncertainty and that risk. Industries globally are going to be put on hiatus for a while in the main, but then they're going to restart. Demand, you know, People need things to have, a, a, the, people will want to get back to normality soon. And to have normality, you need to have the products we all are familiar with, and that needs manufacturing and needs metals. One question I do have and I can't answer is the globalization of industry and interconnectivity good or bad here? Is that going to help us? You know, if one country starts to come out of lockdown and starts producing, are the countries that are already in that stage, their demand going to actually help other countries pull themselves back? Uh, or is it going to be negative in terms of uh, actually kind of the, the distances involved being uh, prohibited to, or slowing down the, the rebound? There's lots of uncertainty, but this is what most likely drove the drop in prices and share values. It's people not knowing what's going to happen. The markets have been reassured by government funding packages and approaches that we're using to deal with this thing. Um, you know, the question is, what next? We have a period of assessment and containment. Do we slowly reopen? How many mines are going to be affected? This all depends on location, country, and the large number of variables that, you know, too many to get into here. One advantage is that mines are often remote. It may be positive in terms of isolation. It may be easier to keep mining populations, people who work on the mines, more isolated and free of this thing, uh, depending on, you know, fly in, fly out, and what people do in their time off and so on. And one other thing we may see, and has been suggested, is we may see fast tracking of automation in mines. If you remove the people from the equation, you can actually start to mine more effectively. Uh, people still need to control these vehicles, but maybe they can work from home, like actually driving automated vehicles or trains rather than from individual offices. So this is actually one way we can potentially keep on mining by fast tracking automation and rolling this out on a larger scale. If we see this go on longer, then certainly we may, so, may well see more investment in this.
you know, there's no foolproof predictions here. Our, our previous pandemics have indicated that change will happen, but not necessarily in a negative way in the longer term. Recovery may or may not be rapid. Watch China and South Korea, watch what's happening there, how their demand changes, industries there are reopening, but where are the products going to go? What are they going to produce? How are they kind of tooling up for the rest of the world to be in lockdown? Certain products, we have high demand. Others are going to see decreases. Uh, it's a very complex picture, but the possible economic impact may be less than the global financial crisis. There's no underlying financial issues here unless you kind of argue that all of capitalism is underlying financial issues. That's not my argument. That's a, an entirely different presentation. And the pace of bounce back and the actions of governments are going to determine how metal mining proceeds from here. And I'm, to finish, I'm going to quote some of the World Health Organization's lessons from the 2003 SARS outbreak. You know, 21st century science played a relatively small role in controlling SARS. 19th century techniques continue to prove their value. This is proving to be the case for COVID-19. And I would basically argue that if we actually do these, apply these techniques uh, and consistently and well, we can actually start to get through this thing and get back into uh, somewhat, or back into normality, if you like. Uh, there's much more to discuss in this area, much more I could talk about. Uh, it's a developing situation, a rapidly developing situation. Obviously, if anybody has any questions now, feel free to ask. Uh, you can also email me uh, or catch me on Twitter. Uh, one final thing I would say, the graphs above the global totals, they kind of uh, smudge out regional uh, trends. They can break down impacts on a country region by country region basis. I don't have the time to do the full analysis, but we do have these graphs. We have graphs, for, for example, this is global copper production split by country. And we could actually look at the impact of this. We see global impacts. We can actually look at how different events have impacted in the past different countries and what these major impacts or what the main impacts are, for example, in this case, on global copper production or gold or nickel or whatever. We have the data, we can unpick this, and we can actually work out the implications of COVID-19 as we get more and more data on COVID-19. Uh, but one thing that I don't have at the minute, and many of us don't, is the, the time to do the full analysis. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we can have a discussion. Hopefully I didn't take too long.